in terms of teaching, there we go. you won the award for teaching excellence at Stanford three years. In terms of service, you have served as the past president of the National Academy of Education, the Philosophy of Education Society, and the John Dewey Society. In terms of honors, you have been awarded contributions to the Education of Women Awards from Harvard University and the American Educational Research Association. You've earned the Medal for Distinguished Service from Teachers College, Columbia, the Lifetime Achievement Award from AERA, and the Award for Distinguished Leadership in Education from Rutgers University. In terms of scholarship, there is your work on mathematical problem solving and of course the philosophy of education, educational theory, and the ethics of care. You have authored more than 200 articles and chapters on these topics. How many books have you authored? Uh, well, the 17th book just came out. I uh, was out at Ohio State to do something, and when I got home there were advanced copies. And no matter how many books you write, it always is a delight to hold a new book in your hand, actually have it there. So that, <coughs> that uh, book is, uh, uh, it's on Amazon now, and it, uh, you can pre-order it, but I, it'll be available by the end of the month. That's, so. that's amazing. That's an amazing career. Yeah, it's a, um, it's a follow-up to the original uh, Caring book. Uh, because you've got 25 years of care ethics there, and I rely very heavily on Virginia Held's work. She put out a, a lovely book a couple years ago entitled uh, The Ethics of Care, Personal, Political, and Global, which is an indication of what's happened with care ethics. It has moved from just the inner circle out into uh, the whole world. Uh, and uh, Virginia and I talked quite a bit when I started this book. The, ti the title of the book is The Maternal Factor uh, with a subtitle, Two Paths to Morality. Because if you look at uh, traditional ethics, traditional moral theory, it's all come out of masculine experience. I mean, it's just the way it is. It's nobody's fault or anything. It's just the way it is. Uh, and uh, we've been edging up on this in care ethics. But this is a frank recognition that we can probably trace uh, the beginnings of morality, at least in part, to maternal instinct and work from there. You can also trace it as traditional ethics uh, has done uh, to self-interest. Now, it's not selfishness, it's self-interest. So in traditional, traditional masculine ethics, the idea is, I better be nice to you, so you'll be nice to me. See, that's the self-interest thing. Uh, but, but the maternal relation is the only relation that starts out other interested. So you think about that. That's, it's the only one where the other is more important than their first self. So foundational to that book was the ethics of, ethics of caring that you referenced, the challenge to care in schools, in which you write, we will see that teachers not only have to create caring relationships in, wi in which they are the carers, but that they also have a responsibility to help their students develop the, ca the capacity right. to care. Right. Students should be given opportunities to learn how to care for themselves, for other human beings, for the natural and human-made worlds, and for the world of ideas. Tell us what inspired you to write this book. Uh, well, I guess all the things I've al already said, but I, I wanted to apply uh, uh, care ethics to, to teaching and schooling uh, and to uh, make it a little more accessible. So of a whole batch of my books, The Challenge to Care is probably one of the, one of the most accessible mm -hmm. and I wanted it to uh, be uh, useful to people who, who are actually teaching. 
But when we talk about helping kids learn to care for one another, um, group work is a wonderful opportunity. But like so many other things that come up in education, it has been pretty badly warped. Um, so sometimes people do group work. They cooperate with one another in order to compete with another group. If you look at Bob Slavin's work, that's, you know, you've got cooperative, competitive groups. If you look at some other work, uh, the kids do group work in order to learn to play various roles in the group. One is the leader, one is the scribe, and the other people have definite roles in it. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with, with that, with the variety of uses to which you can put cooperative groups. They're all sort of interesting. But what, what I've suggested is that the main purpose of working together is to help one another. It, you know, it's that simple. In my math classes, when I was through with an explanation and, and gave an assignment, I'd say, now you can work together. You work together. You, you help one another. And that also gives a teacher an opportunity to walk around the room and see if any kids are left out and you're working together. Many kids are being mean to one another. And if a kid is being left out, what do you do? Well, you pick a couple kids you know are going to be decent and receptive, and you say, hey, how about if Johnny joins you? He's got a couple of good ideas. And you know these kids are going to say, sure. You aren't going to pick out two nasty kids and well, wind up with problems there. So uh, it, it, it's so much easier than getting all of these highly technical, efficient groups put together. They work together. And as you go around the room, if kids are being mean to each other, you just tap them on the shoulder and you say, hey, remember why we're doing this? We're doing this to help one another. That's the idea, help one another. So it works pretty well, actually. In this book, which happens to be my favorite book that you've written, you present a conceptual framework that we as educators might follow in education, keeping things as is, but also spending substantially more time discussing caring issues, including caring for self, caring for the inner circle, caring for strangers and distant others, caring for animals, plants, and the earth, caring for the human-made world, and caring for ideas in traditional philosophical sense. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a nodding school in the making have you entertained that thought? Uh, by the time I thought about it, uh, my husband and I thought about it, um, we decided not to do it. <laughs> so uh, starting a school is a, a very, very big job. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would, rather than do that myself, I would rather uh, work with people who or already established in schools. Uh, the beginning of that, Audrey said, uh, keeping things as they are and still making changes. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the reason for that, I, if I had my druthers, I would throw the whole blankety-blank school curriculum out and start all over again. I think we could do a much better job. Um, I mean, again, there's nothing against men here. I'm married to a wonderful man, as you know, and I've got wonderful male friends. But the curriculum was established by men. I know it just was. Do you suppose that the curriculum would be devoid of parenting, say, or homemaking, if women had been involved from the beginning? I don't think so. But that's not going to change. The curriculum that we have in place is pretty much what they had when Plato put it in. Except now we've got computer science. If they'd had computers, I'm sure Plato would have had computer science in there. Um, but what you can do, and that I found enormously powerful, you can stretch the disciplines from within. And that's what we really have to do. So math teachers should teach more than math. They should include poetry and fiction and biography and history and all the possible connections that you can make with math. They so rarely do it that when a math teacher does it, the kids say, what? 
math teachers can read? Well, yeah, that I think we can do uh, to get teachers to move beyond the narrow borders of their own disciplines and show what it means to be an educated person. I mean, look what we do to high school kids. They have to study four or five subjects, right? And they're taught by people who know only one. And why is that? Why is that? There ought to be some indications. I'm not saying, mind you, don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying that all high school teachers ought to be able to teach all the subjects. That would be impossible. We need specialists for a lot of reasons. But there ought to be some indications that people have studied these other subjects. Otherwise, why bother with it? You know, why go through it if all you're going to do is just specialize in one thing and forget everything else that you ever learned? Well, that's a, a thought project for you. Mm -hmm. Sure. In 1993, you then published your book, Educating for Intelligent Belief or Unbelief. Tell us more about this book and its main premise. That came out of uh, an invitation to do the John Dewey lecture. Uh, uh, yeah, and it, usually the, uh, the Dewey Lecture does become uh, a published book. And I was telling Audrey earlier that it was probably the easiest book I've ever done because I had a whole string of lectures to do, and each lecture became a chapter. Uh, and the, the feedback that I got from the lecture helped in writing the chapter, so it went along very smoothly. The, the basic idea is that we should teach about religion in our public schools. How can you leave out one of the most culturally important features of a society? Just leave it out. Now, I am not religious. I do not belong to any religious institution. But I think it's enormously important that that material be included in someone's education. In fact, so does Richard Dawkins. I mean, he's the most outspoken atheist in the world, I suppose, but he says that all kids should have an opportunity to read and study the Bible as literature. Otherwise, there's a, a big hole in their education. And I think that's exactly right. But when, when you teach about religion, you have to find a way to do it with critical intelligence. And that's where we get in trouble, right there. That's what's so hard. So would you take the approach of teaching multiple religions than in schools? I didn't get the last part. Would you take the approach so of teaching... Echo in this yeah, sorry about yeah. that. Yeah. Would you take the approach of teaching multiple religions in school? Yeah, I, that would be better than nothing, but um, it doesn't usually help very much. Um, there are courses in world religions, uh, and if you look at the textbooks used, they very carefully avoid every controversial issue. Now, why, why do it and avoid all the controversial issues? Somewhere along the line, we have to learn to come to grips with these things without being mean to each other, you know? You have to be able to talk about these things. Um, not too long, just a couple of weeks ago, in fact, I had a, um, a conversation with another former student uh, who is a rabbi, and he was one of the very best TAs I ever had at Stanford. Uh, and so I, we, we got to talking about Passover. And I said, but how can, how can you admire a god who would kill all the firstborns of the Egyptians? That was the question I asked him. I said, what would we say of a human being who did a thing like that? And he gave, he told me a long story about it, about all of the um, uh, studies that Jewish thinkers have done because they've agonized over this question. Uh, and see if you can have that kind of conversation and talk about the agonizing over it and the partial resolutions and the problems that still remain, then you're bringing critical intelligence to, in his case, belief, and in my case, unbelief, see? Certainly, so just avoiding the topic. Yeah. 
In 2003, you published the book Happiness and Education. What are the principles of happiness? <laughs> Makes you happy talking about it. Well, it's, it's <laughs> uh, one book that I, I enjoyed writing. Well, I have enjoyed writing all my books, but, uh, but when I finished Women and Evil, which came out in 1989, I was depressed. I don't want any more of this evil stuff. But uh, writing happiness and education really was a joy. Uh, the idea is, is simple enough. If you talk to parents, you say to a parent, what do you want for your children? The vast majority of them will say, I want my children to be happy, right? I want them to be happy. And yet we never seem to include happiness as a name of education. I mean, you can go over all the school lists of aims, and I have never found one with happiness in there, but you may, you know, there may be one out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I would not tell kids what happiness is. I would not tell them they should be happy. I wouldn't say happiness is fun and we'll have fun all day. You know, and that's, that's no good. But I think we should talk with them about how people have looked at happiness, what the great thinkers have said about it, what novelists have said about it, what ordinary people say about it. So questions such as, can a bad person be happy? You gotta sneak up on that one because if you start right out with that at the high school level, kids are gonna say, they point out to some bad person in the world and they say, I'd like to be as unhappy as that guy. Right? So you gotta start somewhere else. Uh, relationships are, sociologists tell us, mm -hmm. are our single greatest source of happiness. They're also our single greatest source of misery. So we need to talk about these things. Talk about them a little bit. Uh, for many people, spirituality is a source of happiness. Um, in public life, our occupations can be a source of happiness. Some of us are doubly blessed. We're happy in our occupation and we're happy in our home life. Others are happy in one and miserable in the other and some poor folks are miserable in both. So there's all this wonderful stuff to read and to talk about on happiness. And then there is a chapter on happiness in schools mm. and how you can uh, create an, an atmosphere that might be called a happy atmosphere. In terms of the path that students choose to pursue for their professional careers, how do they find happiness? to talk with students about their uh, eventual mm -hmm. professions. You know, this, this is something that came up uh, yesterday when I did some work with the, uh, the Children at Hope organization, which I think, by the way, is doing really some wonderful things. Um, the caution has to be this. We want all kids to succeed but they don't all have to succeed at the academic stuff that we pour into them, right? The child's self-worth should not depend on high academic performance. There are kids who aren't much interested in it. There are kids who are not very good at it. Their aptitudes lie somewhere else, and they should know that we love and support them re regardless of this. I know from experience that when a math teacher compliments a kid on a work of art or an athletic performance or something else, it means a great deal. It means a great deal. It really, really matters. So uh, to help kids to realize that there are many paths to success, not just one, and there are people in this country, I have heard some of them, who more or less say to kids, you've got to work hard, you've got to get ready for college, you have to go to college or be nothing. That's awful. That is really, really awful. So. In 2006, you published the book, Critical Lessons, What Our Schools Should Teach. What should our schools teach? Yeah, no, this, this, this book is really just taking off now, and I'm, I'm pleased with it. I, 
Um, it, it did win an award, that made me happy. Um, I don't think what I've suggested in there will ever be done, so I don't know uh, how, how useful it is. But uh, we, we talk about critical lessons. We ought to give kids an opportunity to think critically about some big issues. Uh, advertising, for example, is, is one fairly obvious one. Why is it that advertising works? It isn't that we believe it, usually. Well, how, how come it works? How come there's a whole science of advertising? Uh, then there are other critical issues. One is war. Uh, and there's a, uh, a chapter on that. Uh, one on self-knowledge. It's another place that we, we don't give enough attention. Uh, in schools. Now, in elementary schools, kids get, I think, more homework than they should get. I told you already that I don't think I had any homework in my first six years of school. Didn't seem to do me any harm. Uh, kids now get a load of homework, and parents, the schools try to involve the parents, right? try to involve the parents. Parents should be interested in their kids' homework. This causes more family fights, probably, than anything else. Parents worked all day, they're tired. Now they're faced with a worksheet from second grade. They don't know what the teacher wants, because you can't tell from second grade worksheets what's wanted. I've looked at some of them, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I, think, I know you're supposed to color in little things somewhere, but uh, what are the criteria? I don't know. And so what does the parent say to the child? Well, if you'd been paying attention, you'd know. Oh boy, so then you've got to fight over second grade homework. Then there are lots of parents, even through high school age, that tell their kids when to do their homework. You know, kid comes home from seventh grade, some parents make them do their homework before they can do anything else. Well, gee, you've been in school all these hours. You need a break. You need a break. Be much, much better, and I talk about that in the chapter, to help kids figure out when they do their best work. When do you do your best work? Under what circumstances? With music or without music? With food or without food? With drink or without drink? I'm talking about innocent drinks here. When I write, I like a glass of wine. <laughs> With kids, it would be a, a Coke or something. Uh, before exercise or after exercise? I mean, all of these are important things to figure out. And there's, uh, there's a, a wonderful uh, book by a mathematician, Jacques Hadamard, called The Psychology of Invention in the Mathematical Field. You may be aware of it. And in it, he looks at studies of how mathematicians work. He was making a contrast between rational and intuitive. But in asking these questions, he ran across a scientist who said, uh, legs are the wheels of thought. And he did all his work pacing back and forth. Uh, and then he ran across a mathematician who did his best thinking in the bathtub. And so he took five baths a day. He was always lying in the bathtub uh, thinking. And, and then you've got the example of Descartes, who did his best thinking in bed. He st stayed in bed in the morning and did his thinking. Well, of course, if you say, tell high school kids that, they'll want to know why they can't stay in bed all morning. Uh, but you get them thinking about, about themselves. When do you do your best work? Under what conditions? And, and help them to move on from there instead of this, this coercive parental control. Now, I, I, th I think that I'm pretty sure that I never did that, right? Yes, she agrees, I never did that. Well, this begs the question, where do you do your best thinking? Where do I do my mm -hmm. best thinking? Um, I do a lot of uh, thinking as I'm uh, falling asleep at night, 
And my husband can testify to that because I will say, yes, that's right. And he'll say, I didn't say anything. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, some of it while I'm reading. So I'll stop reading and, and think. And some on the beach, as we discussed before. And then there is one of your most recent books, When School Reform Goes Wrong, in which you talk about how out-of-school factors impact schooling and you critically look at the devastating effects of No Child Left Behind. Yeah. What are your assertions in this book? This is a short book and it's, it's um, written with the express purpose of inviting people to think. So there are hardly any footnotes in it, which is very unusual because my books are usually loaded with them. So there are hardly any footnotes. And I only refer to a couple people. David Berliner is one uh, because I think it's vital that people look at his stuff. And at the time I was writing it, he was looking at the, um, the work that led to collateral damage, mm. the uh, dreadful cheating ep epidemic. And I refer to Jerry Bracey's work, uh, his um, columns in uh, uh, The Cap'n were enormously mm -hmm. useful. And we corresponded a little bit and then he died. It was really too bad. But the book is just meant to get people thinking, to ask what, what do we mean by choice? What do we mean by standards? Uh, what, what's the purpose of this thing called no child left behind? <coughs> is there any rationality in it at all? What do we mean by national and standards? And it's an easy read. Hmm? By national standards, and do we need national standards? What do I think about mm -hmm. national standards? I can't understand why we need them. Um, think about it for a minute. What would, it, would we need them for, national standards? If you're preparing for college, and these folks who are so crazy about national standards want to prepare everybody for college, right? Don't we already have national standards? We have textbook publishers that pretty much c control what's taught. We have the universities, which have utter control over what will be acceptable to them. Back to the hill by the SATs and the ACTs. So what will we gain from national standards? I, I just can't see the point. Uh, on top of that, we already have state standards, and no state has been able to meet them, right? <laughs> if we have standards at a particular city level, we have the same problem, can't meet them, right? So what's the point? And, on, and then on top of that, and this makes me really mad, we're spending billions of dollars on this. Now, because what follows on standards is tests, and what follows on tests is more tests. Implementing them, grading them, evaluating them, reporting them, arguing over them. Billions of dollars that could go into something meaningful in education. So I'm, I am not a strong advocate of national standards. And when people say, yes, but the countries that are ahead of us have national standards, that's only half true. Some do and some don't have national standards. And some that have national standards begin separating kids out as early as age eight or so, right? And we would not do that. So, you know, don't give me that stuff about other countries and national standards. How many honorary doctorates have you earned? I will be getting my fifth in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I have four and I'll get one more, yeah. That's an amazing accomplishment. You say that you cannot imagine running out of ideas. So what is next for you? Well, I'm in the middle of a book on uh, War and Peace. It's under contract with, with Cambridge. Uh, and we, we haven't settled on the title. First, we, I, I said, well, it's on War and Peace. And my editor said, you can't do that. They'll think it's on Tolstoy. Well, that's right. She's <laughs> right on, on that. So we juggled around. I, I think eventually 
uh, I think the title will be Loving and Hating War, because the more I study it, the more I see this ambivalence, the ambiguities that, uh, and almost every feature of war, there's this love-hate attitude. Uh, and our presidents often say, no one wants war. You heard George Bush say it more than once, nobody wants war. That's not true. There are a lot of people who do, uh, and for a variety of reasons. Um, just studying for this, which is half the fun of writing a book, really. I mean, just learning stuff, I think, is just wonderful. The uh, great scientist, Haldane, you could tell a lot of stories on him, uh, he had to go into the uh, army uh, in World War I, I guess it was, and he admitted that he enjoyed killing people. Enjoyed it. I, how do you come to grips with that? He wouldn't have enjoyed murdering someone because that would be illegal. But in war, it's legal, see? So that's just one example. I've got a whole slew of examples where almost every feature you'd pick out, you'd find this love-hate relationship. So that's what I'm working on now. Um, I'm a little less than halfway on it. Um, but there are other things after that. And, and so here's for graduate students. Uh, one of the things that always uh, kind of worried me was, and it didn't happen often, but once in a while it, it would happen when students couldn't get an idea for a dissertation. I'd say, well, I, I've got to get an idea. That, that worries me, because I just, I, I can't imagine running out of ideas. I can imagine running out of time to do something with those ideas. We're having difficulty figuring out how to do it. That, we all suffer. But running out of ideas, no, I just can't, I can't imagine that. That's a wonderful problem to have. According to Michael Katz, your ego needs have never been dependent on external acknowledgement of your professional achievements. You are a consummate teacher-scholar whose breadth of wisdom extends far beyond the realms of academic and reaches into the spaces where ordinary people who have animals for pets, enjoy gardening and cooking and parenting, and you love detective novels, and you live your day-to-day -day lives there. You convert the abstract into the concrete through the lens of a parent, and a mother, an animal lover, lover, and a gardener, and you find joy in the simplest things, growing your vegetables, canning your strawberries, taking walks on the beach, playing with your cat and dog, cooking dinner, having nice conversations about a wide range of topics, but you never let your status as a famous scholar and lecturer and author interfere with treating everyone with the same kindness, thoughtfulness, and consideration that you would expect people to show you. No matter how busy, people always come first for you. That's a nice tribute to you. He's very generous. He's a very nice man.